Good morning, Pinelands, brothers and sisters. It's good to be gathered once again this morning with you all. We're coming to the God who light and darkness is all the same to him. Mountains and valley tops are all the same to him. Yes, all the same to him. What matters is not where we are, but where he is. And he is with us as people this morning as we gather. Amen? Amen. So let's rise up. Let's say with the psalmist that better is one day in your courts than a thousand days elsewhere. Amen. Amen. Is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, and thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, and thousands elsewhere. And thousands elsewhere. Yeah. How lovely. Cause 
better is one day better is one day better is one day without a swear better is one day better is one day better is one day thousands elsewhere voices better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere, and thousands elsewhere. Morning, morning, Pinelands. Morning. My name is Andrew Carr. I'm one of the elders here. This morning's uh, call to worship comes from Philippians uh, chapter two, verses six through eleven. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let us praise God through Jesus Christ this morning and give him all the honor and glory he deserves. prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all he chose seed of Israel's race, he ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord God, one of the 
One of the big effects of sin is the separation that we have between us and God, right? The reason the world is how it is, all jacked up and messed up, is because there's this great chasm between us and God. This causes a great chasm between you know, each other and even ourselves, right? If we think about it, we don't even know ourselves. People are trying to find themselves, right? <laughs> sin has done such a, such a great a great disease that's really just messed us up. I'm not sure how to even put it into words. You know, we can look and we know, right? But God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we celebrate Christmas, the season once again, you know, he came from such a far distance. Even as our brother read uh, Philippians 2 this morning, he went lower and lower and lower. He became a slave. And not just a slave, but he willingly put himself on the cross for you and I. He came from such a far distance. And I don't know, I, I think about sometimes when my child wants me to go to CVS and buy them something. I'm like, mm, I'm kind of tired, you know? <laughs> no. God willingly, willingly, and joyfully, it says in Hebrews, that for the joy that was set before him, he went to the cross. Amen? Amen. For you and me, he joyfully and willingly wanted to come. And so we have a new song to, uh, to learn this morning about that. In the highest 
shepherd I shall not want in green pastures he makes me lie down he restores my soul and leads me on for his name for his great name Surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside me all. of my enemies throw the arrow flies and the terror of night is at my door I'll trust you Lord surely goodness and surely mercy Beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever, and bless your holy name. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, shadow of death, I will fear no evil, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are on my side, and surely good Surely mercy, right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your 
your house forever and bless your holy name. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Roger Smalling. I'm a missionary with this denomination. And uh, again, welcome to Pilots Presbyterian Church. And we're going to pray for some things today uh, before the message uh, by the pastor. Uh, the, uh, you know, the book of Acts tells us that the Christians, quote, devoted themselves uh, to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, breaking of bread, and uh, prayers, and uh, we're going to, we do those things here uh, in this church, and we're going to start with prayer, so uh, let us pray. Uh, God, our Father, we read in your word that uh, you call us saints and faithful brothers and sisters. You call us trophies of your grace, and you called us to be holy. You commanded us to be holy because you're holy and you're perfect. And uh, you have been, you are always holy, and you've called us to be faithful, but the fact of the matter is, we have not always been faithful this week, and we have not always been holy, because we are not perfect yet. And therefore, we repent for those areas of failure in our life, because we do not want those areas of failure to be a hindrance to the flow of your Holy Spirit in our life. Uh, because we are here to receive benefit from you. We're here to receive growth from you. We're here to receive edification, exhortation, and comfort, as your word says. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, there for forgiveness for every sin, known and unknown, in our hearts, in the name of Jesus, so that we can hear your word by your spirit. Now, I want to pray for the church as a whole. I pray, Father, that you will grant favor with the people in the community as you did with the apostles, that the message of the gospel may be heard in this community, that, Father, you would work by your spirit to break the spirit of indifference and apathy. For your word says that you added to the church daily such as those who were to be saved. Heavenly Father, we do have people in our church who have been sick uh, and are sick. I pray for protection from the COVID virus that it not spread through the church. And I thank you that those few who have contracted it have recovered and recovered well without going through anything really that serious. And I thank you for that in the name of Jesus so that there be no long-term effects from this and that you not let it spread any further among us. And I wanna pray for those in the church with life-threatening illnesses, uh, such as, for example, cancer, um, for Anna Alcazar, who has been diagnosed with cancer recently. And I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that this peculiar difficulty, uh, you will intervene in this by miraculous means or by secondary means through medicine, because her condition is, is rather peculiar. I, <clears throat> I pray for those with diabetes or uh, other ailments like that that are life-threatening. Lord, uh, you are in charge of life. You're the Lord of life, and you're the one who decides how much of a threat anything is to be to it. The age of miracles is not over. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I pray for the healing of those people, whether by medical means or by your divine hand, according to your will and your choice. I pray for the question of persecution. We know, Father, that uh, uh, in the future, or uh, perhaps some of us now are maybe going through some degree of persecution, that each member here will stand strong in persecution uh, because your word says you teach the tongue of the righteous to answer. And I pray for the covenant children, the children in this church. Lord, when we think of the avalanche of ungodly, wrong teaching, anti-Christian propaganda uh, through educational institutions, through the media, through their friends, through the school, schools, we think, how is it possible for these, for our children to not be 
totally taken over by this avalanche of corruption that is running rampant in our society today? And the answer is you, Lord. You are the answer. Your spirit is the answer because your word says where the, when the enemy comes in by a, uh, with a flood, you will raise up a standard against him. And you can preserve the minds and thinking of our people. Thank you for that. I pray for the persecuted brothers in China, Iran, Muslim countries, particularly in China, Lord, where uh, the, the Chinese government is cracking down hard on Christians, forbidding uh, Christian teachers to teach, requiring that atheism be taught in the schools. Lord, there is <clears throat> all of these things are no match for the power of your gospel and for the power of your spirit. And we pray for the strengthening of that church in that region. I pray for the missionaries supported by this church that you protect them and anoint them with power for their ministries. I pray for our government on all levels that you give godly people or make the people godly. You're the light. You reveal what is hidden in darkness. If there is indeed corruption that needs to be exposed, I pray that you will expose it so that it can be excised in the name of Jesus. Finally, Lord, I want to list some things we're thankful for. I want to thank you that we have not been rained out of the services so far this year. And that's a blessing. You are the God in charge of everything, include the weather. Sooner or later, that, that has to change. But we thank you for your timing in this as we get, get things together and, uh, and, and uh, prepare for the future. We thank you for the freedoms that we have, the freedoms we have so far and the supply of our needs, and above all, for our eternal salvation through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now we're going to take up an offering as a testimony to you of our gratitude that you are our God and money is not our God. In the name of Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, amen. Amen. Uh, one other detail, uh, children, you may now be dismissed your class. And uh, this Sunday, it's all the children go every last cotton picking one get to go to your uh to your classes so don't miss out go for it kids every single one of you we don't discriminate against anybody we come to sing the song of emmanuel the god who is with us proclaim him song of Emmanuel, this the Christ who was long foretold, low in the shadows of Bethlehem, promise of dawn now our eyes behold, God most high in a manger laid, lift your voices and now proclaim, great and glorious love has come to us, Join now with the hosts of heaven. Come we to welcome Emmanuel, King who came with no crown or throne. Helpless he lay the invincible, maker of Mary, now Mary's son. Oh, what a wisdom to save us all, shepherds, sages before and fall. Grace and majesty, what humility, come on, bend to me, adore him. Go spread the news of Emmanuel, joy and peace for the weary heart. Lift up your heads for your King is come. Sing for the light overwhelms the dark. Glory shining for all to see. Hope alive, let the gospel ring. God has made a way. Tell the world's name is Jesus. Glory shining for all to see. Hope alive, let the gospel ring. God has made a way, he will have the praise. Tell the world his name is Jesus. Glory.
Oh, sing with me, church. Sing with me. Gloria, Gloria. Let's go. Good morning. Today is the third Sunday in Advent. Two weeks ago, we lit the prophecy candle and remembered those who first spoke the promise of the coming Christ child. Last week, we lit the Bethlehem candle, a symbol of the preparations being made to receive and cradle the Christ child. The third candle on the Advent wreath is called the Shepherd's Candle. It remembers the first in a long line of people who joyfully shared the good news of the Savior's birth. The candle is a different color, reminding us that our period of waiting is half over. <clears throat> so this is Psalm 146, 5 through 10. Blessed is he who, whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, who's made, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps the faith forever. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Uh, this is from Matthew 2, 10 to 11. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. Now for the prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, with joy and praise, we acknowledge the signs that your kingdom has come in Jesus Christ. We rejoice in the forgiveness of sin. We rejoice that you have made us new creatures with Christ. With joy, we commit ourselves to the proclamations of the good news of great joy. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. I'll be reading our reading this morning from John 1. Verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was God, with God in the beginning. This is the Word. Pat. Huh? That's funny to you? Okay. You know I got an interesting sense of humor. Um, just a, two, a few quick announcements. Um, the first is uh, the ladies are just having like a casual hangout talk uh, right over here in the picnic business. Uh, 
please, even if you don't plan to stay and you are a lady, uh, stop by and get a gift. They have a gift to give every lady here. Uh, so please stop by, say hello, and don't feel guilty if you can't stay. Uh, but for the rest of you, just, yeah, make it a point, please, to, to hang out and uh, converse a bit. Um, I'm sure that everybody has somewhere they can go. We always have somewhere to go. We're Miami people, but uh, I'm glad that the ladies made a point to just intersect a bit right here. Another announcement is that just don't forget we're having a Christmas Eve service on the 24th, 5.30 p.m. We will do the inside-outside thing, so for you uh, who are cool outside and you want a candlelit service and you want to get uh, candlelit, I mean dark, and you want a little mosquito bites, uh, we'll be out here for you who are passionate about being inside. We'll, we'll let that happen too. Um, also, uh, we are going to start, keep this in mind, when you come here, we're going to start collecting uh, some money to help out Anna with her cancer treatment that, you know how it is, uh, some things are covered, some things are not. So if you would like to line out on something to our Mercy Ministry Fund, you can do that right now and, and you know, drop it off at the office or just think about it uh, for the future. Another thing just to say, we're, 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 we're jumping out of Revelation for about four weeks and we're going to be in John doing Advent. Me, I'll bring a message, Chris Barrett will bring a message and that, that Greek guy, I uh, forget his name, is it, is it Yodi? Yanni, he will bring a message uh, from John. All right, let me pray and, and jump in. Heavenly Father, we, we really need to have right now in this very moment a supernatural, not from us, not possible with us, not anywhere near capable with what we have by ourselves. We need the Spirit of God. We need your Spirit who is God Almighty, who dwells within us to Help us to receive, help us to hear, and to enjoy, believe, and worship you in this moment. So, Father, show us the grace that we need to both speak and be spoken to right now. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to do a, a series on who. This today is who. And then we're going to do what. So, what does, this, what, what does this who do? And also, how. Who, what, and how. Um, I think a lot, no one denies that, the, uh, that there was a Jesus, that there is a Jesus, but we all have a, a different idea of that. So some people see him just as a prophet, some kind of teacher, some kind of enlightened guru. Others see him just as a miracle worker or some kind of a revolutionary of sorts. Others see him like some patron mascot for a nation or some patron deity for America. Others see him as a life coach, an inspiring guy, and others will see him as a madman, but no one denies that he exists. And so what I want to do today is to make the who of Jesus really clear and clutter, move away all the projections that man put on Jesus. That's probably my kid in there screaming. It's probably Elias. <laughs> Beloved, Jesus defies all of our projections of what we think he is like. And I think one of the things that I don't find helpful about Christianity is we get kind of boggled up in the wrong who's, you know. What do you think about John MacArthur? What do you think about John Piper? What do you think about Tim Keller? What do you think about such and such? Those who's are not really ultimately important. What you say about the who of Christ really matters. So here's the first who category of Jesus that we get from this text. So we can understand the what that we will hear next Sunday. And that is that he is and never has not been. He is and he's never not been. In the beginning was the word. So that's John's very simple way of saying that Jesus Christ always was, never has not been. He never started to exist. He has existed eternally. In the beginning, he already was, okay? Now, if you're a Bible reader, John is picking up on the statements of Exodus where God's, where they ask God, what's your name? He says, I simply exist. I simply am. That's who I am. Jesus is the great I am who has existed forever from the very stretches of eternity. He's always 
been. He's simply always been. So Jesus is the one who, in his eternal in his eternal identity, he has never learned, he has never grown, he has never not been anything all that he is. He has never been anything other than what he always has been in eternity. And you say, why, why, why does Jesus being eternal matter? Like, why does that matter? Well, here's why it matters. We have a problem with an infinite God. Okay? So God is infinite. And so... In order for somebody to do something of infinite value and reconcile us and make us right with some being who is infinite, he must be infinite to make that infinitely valuable. You have not offended, you have not betrayed a created being. You have betrayed, betrayed someone who's eternal. So Jesus must be greater than the world in order to solve the world's deepest issues. Unless you are greater than reality, you cannot solve reality's problems. Unless you made reality, you can't remake reality, which is what is said here later about Jesus. It says that all things were made through him, and without him not anything was made that was made. Only the one who made all things can remake all things. Only the one who always has been can change what is wrong in what is. Only somebody who has no beginning can put an end to all the drama that has happened in time. Listen, you take every single human being, you take every philosophy, you take every thought, you take every pol politician and every political idea, you take every book, you take every action, you take every solution, you take every religious figure, and all of them added together are not eternally valuable, so therefore can they can do nothing to resolve our ultimate issue. Unless you are eternal, you cannot resolve what is wrong in time. And beloved, this is why the ministry of Jesus in time is so significant. You say, why is Jesus obeying for us in 33 years? Why does that matter? What does 33 years of him obeying matter? Because the one who obeyed in 33 years was eternally valuable. So his 33 years of obedience really, is really important. You say, what, what, what's the big deal about Jesus dying on a cross for six hours? Why is six hours of crucifixion so important? Because the one who was on that cross for six hours was none other than the eternal, almighty, everlasting God. So those six hours are powerful six hours. The payment of Jesus in those six hours is eternally valuable to eternally forgive you of all of your sins because the blood that was shed by that man was none other than God Almighty. The one who always was died. That's why that matters. Otherwise... Isn't there a dead guy on a cross? Many people have been crucified. What Jesus did as a man in time and space eternally matters because he is eternally. And beloved, listen, we all have a bunch of stories that are significant. We have personal stories that are significant. We have public stories that are significant. But listen, there's only one story that is big enough and large enough in time to move you, to shape you, to define you, to, to give you hope. And it is the story of this man who is beyond time into eternity. And beloved, you know what's great about Jesus being eternal? You will always know him and you will never exhaust how sweet it is to know him. Because you are knowing one who is intimate, inf infinite. You will be able to... Trust him in your grace, in your need, and your sin, and none of your sin and your needs will ever exhaust Jesus' grace. Why? Because he is eternally valuable in his grace. And so you will never exhaust his grace. His grace will exhaust you. Beloved, you literally have found in Jesus Christ the one person that you could look to all the time for all of your issues and be fixed on them, whether it's your parenting issues, whether it's your personal issues, whether it's your family issues, whether it's church issues. Jesus is the eternal son of God who is eternally valuable and therefore every single situation and person you find yourself in, you can look to Jesus. Because the one who came in a time always existed 
and he is eternal. Who is Jesus? He is the one who is and never has not been. <laughs> He's much more than a baby in a manger, much more than a man, but not less. But here's the second thing that John wants us to pick up, is that he is the first and only subject. He is the first and only subject. It says in the beginning was the word. Now, word for the Jews would be God's way of revealing himself, God's ways of acting, God talking about himself. So basically, John is saying that Jesus is God's subject. He's God's word. He's God's topic. He is God's revelation. And so when you consider everything that God has said, John is saying to us that Jesus is the subject and center of all that God has said. Jesus is not a subject amongst many subjects. He is the word, which means that he is God's subject. And it says, in the beginning was the word, which means that he was God's subject from the very beginning, not later when Matthew comes on the scene. Jesus has always been God's primary subject and topic. In the beginning was the word. Beloved, everyone in the Bible, including me and you, we, we, we do this. We do this. We point to the subject. But Jesus points to himself as the subject. Beloved, there's, if you, some of you who are teachers, you know that there's some teachers that have, they teach many subjects. And there's some teachers that only have one subject they teach on. God is saying, listen. I got one subject, one topic, all the time from the beginning, and that is my son. Jesus, listen, beloved, he's not, I, I understand what people mean when they say this, but Jesus is not the reason for the season. Jesus is a reason for existence. He's the reason for the cosmos. He's the reason of human history. He's the reason of eternity. He is the subject and center of all reality and eternity and time. He is the subject of God, the subject of scriptures, not the subject of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the subject of Genesis 2 Revelation. He is God's subject. God's only subject. The Bible is not about the Ten Commandments as a subject. The Bible is not about even Adam and Eve as a subject. The Bible is about Jesus Christ as the subject. He was a subject of the Joseph story. He was a subject of the Abraham story. He was a subject of the Moses story. He was a subject of the Solomon story. He's a subject of all the kings in those books. He's a subject of the prophets. He's a subject of the Psalms. He is a subject of everything in Scripture. And John will say a whole lot of interesting things about Jesus. He's the true wine. He is the true shepherd. He is the true living water. He is the true temple. He is the true priest. He is the true sacrifice. He is the true lamb of God. He is the true son. He is the true Israel. He is the subject of subjects. Jesus is not like the prophets who teach about the subject, Jesus is the subject that is taught by the prophets. And you say, what does this mean for us personally? Well, here's a few things. When we talk about sin, we're going to talk about Jesus as the subject of, as a subject of the sin conversation. So this, what, what's, what, what's the, at the center of sin, what is what? Jesus, the sin bearer, is how we're going to talk about sin. We're not going to talk about sin without Jesus being the subject of that conversation. Make sense? So when we talk about sin, how do we talk about it? In light of the fact that Jesus is the subject of that conversation as the sin bearer. When we talk about God's law, which we do, we are not going to talk about God's law apart from Jesus being the subject who is what? The perfect law keeper for us. And so we see all of God's you must. In light of Jesus being the ultimate he did, we understand God's law and we talk about it as Jesus being the subject. We will talk about all sorts of things. We'll talk about parenting and we'll talk about marriage. And guess what? Jesus will be the subject of the marriage, marriage and parenting conversation. We will, we will talk about God's ultimate husband of us and God's ultimate son as we talk about that. We will talk about sexual sin. We will talk about partiality and bigotry. And we will talk about pride. And we will talk about everything. But guess what? What will be the subject as we talk about all those topics? Jesus Christ. Because why? Because God is the subject that hijacks every topic. 
We cannot talk about partiality or greed or sexual sin without Jesus as the word. The definitive subject gives us clarity out of how to see those things. I was talking to my friend Leslie sitting over there with her beloved over there. And I said, I was talking about like the centrality of Christ. Let me try, let me try to look at y'all inside with the camera <laughs> so I don't forget about y'all. And I said, listen, Jesus is not one room in many rooms of Christianity. Jesus is the only room that every single room is packed into in Christianity. It's kind of like the kid. You know what my kids do? They, 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 I don't know. Kids want to make houses like homeless people in your house, you know? They, they make all the little houses in the living room. Beloved, that's Christianity. Every single topic, every single thing is in the supremacy of Jesus topic subject. We talk about nothing and no one. We don't talk about gender, sexuality, or ethnicity. We don't talk about anything apart from Jesus being the subject. Let me give an example of this for us Latinos. So yeah, you probably heard this many times. Latino heels, the Latinos uh, will we'll hear about the Jericho story, okay? And they say, hey, this Jericho story is about how God knocking down the walls and bringing you from, you know, Latin America to the United States. Or you, you hear the Abraham story, Abraham, que es la historia de Abraham, right? Que, que es eso? And you'll say, well, you know, in the same way that Abraham left his town and went somewhere of prosperity and blessing. By the way, he was a homeless dude with tents when he went to the promised land, but that's another conversation, okay? Um, that story about Abraham going to the promised land is about you going to America. No, it's not. That story is about Jesus leaving his homeland of heaven and coming to earth to be a wanderer and buying you back by his blood and taking you home. It's not about you, Latin American. It's not about your Jericho walls. It's about Jesus Christ being crushed for sinners. Every story, every topic, Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word, God's subject. That's Christianity. All right, moving on. God is saying, stay on topic, church. Stay on topic. Stay on topic. But he's not just the first and only subject. He is the supreme and final subject word as well. He is the supreme and final word. So to say that Jesus is the word is to also say that, listen, God spoke in a lot of ways over time, but now this is God's final say of saying, okay? Jesus is not just the subject of scripture, but he is the last final word and final say. So listen, when, when, me, and, me and my family, we, 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 when we're planning on going on a trip, we start looking at pictures of the place and, 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 and descriptions of the place and, and whatnot, okay? But once we get there, those pictures that showed us the place and those descriptions that showed us the place, they kind of, they're not necessary no more, okay? Make sense? Once you get there, you are there. So listen, Israel as a nation was a really good way to reveal God, but when Christ shows up, Jesus the Israelite is the final and better and ultimate and last way, even though Israel served his purpose, Okay, uh, kings, prophets, and priests was a good way to know God, but when Christ comes, he is the last prophet, he is the last priest, and he is the last king, and now he is the final revelation of God as a final prophet, priest, and king. Dreams and visions were a great way to know God before Christ came, but when Christ comes, guess what? Here's your ultimate vision and dream. Jesus Christ himself is the best and final way to know God. There were sacrifices and ceremonies. That was a good way to know God, but Jesus is better as the sacrifice itself. There was Palestine. There was Jerusalem. That was a great way to know God, but now that Jesus has come, he is better than Palestine, better than Jerusalem. He is better than that mount where God spoke. He is better than the tablets, better than the Ark of the Covenant. He is Jesus. God, Jesus is God's last, final, ultimate, supreme word, and there needs to be no other discussions. I love what Hebrews says. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different days. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is God's best and last word. Jesus is God's ultimate mic drop. I've said it all in him. Now look to him. Now so understand reality in light of him. 
What more can I say than what I've said in not just a word, not just shadows of the word, but the word itself, himself, is Jesus. God saying that he's holy was a good way to understand holiness. But you want to know how God has seen as supremely holy? Look at Jesus who had no sin on the cross, crushed eternally as a sinless one for our sin. There you see God's holiness. God saying, I am merciful and compassionate and long-suffering. That was interesting to hear before, but you will never understand compassion and mercy apart from seeing it now primarily in Jesus Christ as eternal and yet finite stretched out on the cross for us. That's where we understand that God is merciful. That's where we see God is holy. That's where we see God is faithful. It is in Christ. Beloved, if you, do you want to know God savingly and supremely? Don't look to reason. Don't look to your rationale. Don't look to creation. Don't look to the media. Don't look to, don't look to all the cultural prophets and gurus. Don't look to your experiences. Don't look to your emotions. Don't look to self or society or culture or sociology or psychology. Don't look to tradition. Look to Jesus Christ. That is where you will know who God is and who you are and what everything is because Jesus is the word. Look what, look, look, look what Christ says. Christ puts the disciples onto seminary right before he's about to depart and go to heaven to his place. He says, then the Messiah have to suffer, Luke 24, verse 26, have to suffer these things and enter into his glory. Then beginning with Moses, chapter 1, verse 1. And all the prophets, he interpreted them for the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Later he says that these words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This is what is written, that the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Beloved, let me ask you a question. How many books have you read on who Jesus is in the last year? One? Zero? I, let, let, me, let me get in your kitchen. My, my guess is you probably haven't written one. Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Do you think that there is something that can be said that is greater than what God says about Jesus and who he is? Do you think so? John says, no, Jesus is God, subject of all subjects. Know him. Consider him. Every other subject, you will know it in two seconds. Jesus is the one subject that you will never know fully in eternity. Think about heaven. We'll be in there for a billion years. Well, I don't know if there's time. And you will still not know Christ exhaustively because he's God. That's the only reason why heaven will not be mad and boring. Because the one who you are knowing is God's ultimate supreme subject. But we got over that now, right? And we got a whole lot of things to emphasize now. No, beloved, Jesus is God's subject. Supreme revelation. Do you want to know your identity and how to live for God? Don't look to all the identity experts. Look to Christ. You want to know how to be holy? Don't look to the latest six steps, the latest revival experience, and the latest emotional how-to. Look to Christ to be holy. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. You can do what apart from me? Zero, zip, zilch, nothing apart from me. You want to know what it is to be a man or woman? Don't look to the egalitarian experts and don't look to the patriarchal, misogynist experts. Look to Christ to know what a man and a woman is. You want to know what it is to be a parent? You want to know what it is to be an American? You want to know what it is to be whoever you are? Look to what God has revealed about you in Jesus Christ. But the difference between Christian and everything else, you know the difference? We understand everything in light of the revelation of Jesus Christ. We don't know what love is. We don't know what, we don't know what reconciliation is. We don't know what transformation is. We don't know what humility is. We don't know what holiness is. We don't know anything unless we know it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. I need to see Jesus to know what it is to love. Every other religion is how you understand love and, and transformation by the concept itself. Jesus is the revelation reference point that we must understand everything through. What Paul says, what Paul says 
in his letters. 1 Corinthians 1.28, God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world. What is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one can boast in his presence. But it's from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became God's wisdom for us. So what does it mean to be, be, what does it mean to be wise? Christ is wisdom. Our righteousness, what does it mean to be righteous? Christ reveals that. Sanctification, what does it mean to be sanctified? Christ is that. And redemption, where we're going, in order that it is written, the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. Now this is very hard because, because when Paul was preaching, they're like, yo, why don't you preach to them other dudes who bring in all of that Roman philosophy and Greek philosophy? Why don't you talk like them? Because Christ is our wisdom. Christ is our righteousness. And if it's not saying something about him, I ain't talking about it because every single reference point is Jesus. Christ is my wisdom. Not philosophizing like them Greek folk. I see Jesus and what he reveals ultimately about himself. God's last and final word to be, I understand everything. He is the supreme and last word of God. But I got two more points. And I got like six sub points. No, I'm just kidding. He is divine. Man, I've already heard enough. No, 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 you haven't. No, you haven't. There's more to say, all right? He is divine and yet distinct. The word was with God, and the word was God. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses, listen, whenever, whenever heretics talk about Greek, don't ever listen. They don't know Greek, okay? They think, they, think, they think that you think they know Greek, and then they say something. They say, oh, you see, well, it says a God, and that clearly means that Jesus was not God. Every Greek student who has had Greek for six minutes knows that that does not mean that. When you don't put a definite article like the before God, you are stressing the qualities of something, not saying something like that means he's not this. It's saying he is this qualitatively. So you could rewrite this saying all that God was the word was also qualitatively he was all that God was as the word. That's what that's what it means in the Greek. Okay, but it's saying that he was all that God was, but he was also with God, which means that he was not God in the sense of he was a different person. So he was all that God was qualitatively. Now your your head's starting to hurt. I get it. Jesus makes your head hurt. He is not a cute little cuddly boxed up God. He makes your head hurt. He is all that God is, and yet he is distinct as a person who is not the Father. He is divine and distinct. He said, okay, pastor, all right, fine, I got it. Uh, can I go now arguing next time at Jehovah's Witness? No, that's not the point. That's not my point. Why is this important? But this is why it's important. Listen, someone has to obey the Father who's not the Father for you to be right with God. So Jesus can't obey himself, okay? Someone has to die in your place who is not the Father in your place. Someone who's not the Father has to be punished by the Father for you to be right with the Father. So Jesus cannot punish himself, okay? He can't give himself eternal papaos and save you. Someone other than Jesus, someone other than the Father must be punished by the Father for you to be right with God. Someone has to stand in your place and hold your seat in heaven who is not the Father in your place. If Jesus is... Not divine, he can't die. If he's not someone different from the Father, then he cannot save us. Beloved, the Jesus of Mormonism cannot save you because he is distinct but not divine. The Jesus of the Jehovah's Witness cannot save you because he is distinct but not divine. The Jesus of the oneness Pentecostal. Let let me me just, have, have you ever met these people in Miami who say, I didn't get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, but I just got baptized in the name of Jesus. That's called oneness Pentecostals. They believe that God the Father put on, took off his Father mask and came down, and then he put on his Jesus mask, and now he's got the Holy Spirit mask. They don't believe in a God who is triune. And guess what? That God can do zip, zero, zilch to take your place before God because God cannot punish himself. He must punish someone in your place that God cannot save. And that God cannot love you either because guess what? If he was not loving someone eternally, then he only became love when he began to love you in time. So that God, let's just leave it this. That God cannot save. 
only one who is fully divine and yet other than the Father can be the one, the who, that we need. And so some of you may say, all right, fine, 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 all right. It's important for our salvation, yada, 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 okay. Let me tell you something, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get real practical. Most of the weird things and the crazy things that you do are related to the fact that you're not believing in a God like this. Let me give you some examples. You ready for a lot of examples? What does it look like for you to not trust a triune God on the ground? What does it look like? What is it flushed out like when you don't see one who is divine yet distinct unity and diversity in your God worldview? What does it look like on the ground? You ready? Just one example. All right, where am I at? Uh, diverse, diversity with no unity leads to weird theology where everyone believes everything about everything. So there's, there's diversity in thought, but there's no unity, so there goes heresy, okay? There's diversity with no unity. But how about this? How about unity with no diversity? Have you ever been to a church where everyone dresses the same? So some of you go to churches where everyone is conservative, and some of you go to churches where everyone's cool. Some of you go to churches where everyone talks the same, acts the same, raises their kids the same. That is, that is unity with no diversity. You know what that is? It's called a cultish church. So unity and diversity are important. Or how about with, how about with gender? What happens when we have unity but no diversity? We have abuse of women. Right now, men are abusing women by playing sports and kicking their butts literally. Unity, but no diversity. And women are being abused by men going in the bathrooms and abusing them that way. There is unity and there is no diversity. Guess what? That leads to abuse, right? I don't know about you. I got a daughter. Someone goes in the bathroom who's a man. That's abuse. Unity, but no diversity. But what's the problem with diversity and no unity? You have women that can't vote, women that have no rights, women getting beat down because... They are different, but they are not unique. We always have to have unity and diversity in every kind of conversation. Otherwise, we lead to some aberrance. Y'all follow me now? Or you, I'm, I'm, I sound like Dr. Seuss. How about, how about, how about in, in society? What happens when there's diversity but no unity? You get communism, and people die every time. Unity with no diversity. How about diversity with no unity? So... There is differences, but we're not the same. There goes Jim Crow and slavery. You are different, but not the same. Wherever there is not unity and diversity, at the same time, we are going to miss something ethical. Y'all tracking me still? Now it's getting a little quiet, right? How about with something like hearing from the Lord? What happens when everybody hears something different from the Lord? No one knows what the, what, Lord, what the Lord is saying, right? That's diversity with no unity. What about unity with no diversity? Well, we all hear the same things, but there's no unique application. Beloved, listen. The reason why we don't have unity and diversity is not because we're not championing unity and diversity enough. It's because we don't have doctrinal, God-centered, Trinitarian, exalting theology. So we got to make it up on the back end and always talk about unity and always talk about diversity. Why? Because we, are, we, we have bought into a lie that theology about the supremacy of God and his awesomeness in being one and three does not see us, transform us, and move us to be different. We have bought into that lie, and so we're always talking about unity with no diversity or diversity with no unity because we think this stuff is not powerful, right? I just get at least one amen. The more Trinitarian, God-centered, uni and diversity that is exalted, believed, and enjoyed, the more all of our categories function right. He is divine and distinct. Beloved, how you see Jesus will be connected to so many things in your life. All right, I have one more point. I have one more point. He is and always was complete. He is and always was complete. And the word was with God and the word was God. So just slow down with me real quick. God is saying that he's always been around himself. He's always been with himself. Now, you can read over that really quickly, but just stop a second. 
God is saying, listen, I've always been with somebody. I've always been accompanied. I've always had a family. I've always been with. The one who is divine and distinct has always been with. Listen, how, how do we oftentimes teach uh, about God to kids? What do we do? You know, well, well, and if you've ever done this, please don't, 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 don't be ashamed, okay? Don't be ashamed. Just, 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 just stop doing it, okay? They say, they say yeah, this is why God made the world, because you know what? He was like up there, and he was just like, oh, I don't know. I'm just going to board. Like, let's just bring some, you know, stars, and oh, I'm still bored. Let me bring some, some water and, and, and plants. And, and like, God was needy, so he made the world. Beloved, God has been eternally with himself and utterly always satisfied. So you say, why did God make the world if he always was with himself and happy? Because he wanted to. Because he wanted to. Beloved, Jesus, our God, is not the girl in high school who cannot not have a boyfriend. Remember that girl? Were you that girl? Jesus is a girl in high school. Now, it's a picture who was fine with none of you being their little boy toy, little boyfriends or boy whatevers. He is not Jerry Maguire. Remember Jerry Maguire? You complete me. God is self-existent, self-satisfied. He has been with himself. He needs nobody other than himself. The one who came in a time was eternally with himself, satisfied, and therefore, they don't need your love. They've always had the love of each other to enjoy. You need their love. Let me say this today. We, we had a great worship service, right? Right? We're having a great worship service. Some of you are like, I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> the God we worship needs none of our worship. He's always been adulating and congrat congratulating himself. He doesn't need one little hallelujah chorus. He's good. God needs none of our actions. He's always been the one who has proceeded from himself. That is that old school language of the church. Beloved. God does not need your promises. He does not need your passions. He does not need your worship. He does not need your posts, your nationality, your preferences, your opinions and feelings. He needs nothing from He needs none of your piety, none of your devotion, none of your Bible reading. He is altogether with himself happy. <laughs> Say, oh my goodness, that sounds, that makes me feel small. Yeah, I should. <laughs> look at John, look at, look what Peter says. I'm sorry, what, what, what Paul says when he's preaching. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in shrines made by hands. Check this out. This is so, so like, like barbecue your mind as you read it. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. He himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. Do you know why work salvation is so repulsive? Because you say, it assumes that God needs your works to do something. God needs none of your works. He needs his works that were accomplished in himself and his son. God is all satisfied, all sufficient by himself. In the beginning, the word was God and the word was with himself. Now, you know what? What do you do? with a God, I don't know about you, but like, I feel like growing up in church, I shouldn't say grow up in church because I didn't grow up in church, but going to church, I feel like the way I see God is he's this wimp, needy being who's always unhappy because you're not giving him what he needs. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? He needs you to give more money to be happy. He needs you to volunteer more to be happy. He needs you to be more radical and go, you know, go to Africa and go build a well because to make him happy. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But he's this needy guy, needy being who needs you to make him happy. Our God is happy by himself whether you do nothing. You know what that leads me to do? Worship him, love him, serve him, honor him, obey him, preach him. My God, I obey a God, I love a God, I serve a God that needs nothing from me. That's my God. 
Not the God of American Christianity who needs people to make him happy. No, I serve a God and I please a God who is utterly happy, Father, Son, and Spirit forever. That's our God. He is and was complete. He is divine, yet different. He is God's last word. He is God's wonderful subject. And he is the one who is and always was. When you see all this stuff being talked about now, that's Jesus in a woman's womb. Who he is is amazing. It's amazing. Let me pray and move us on. Father, thank you so much that... (laughs) As we consider your what, the things that you did, as we consider how, we need to understand and know the beauty of who. You don't need us. We need you. You don't need our prayers. We need your son's prayers for us. You don't need our worship. You need your worship of yourself. You don't need us. And that God that leads us to find security and safety in you and live and walk through walls for you because you are sufficient by yourself. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right. Now, we're going to do something special today. Everybody who went through the members class, please come up here and don't fall on the way up. So that's Jennifer, Janet, Marilyn, and Sean. There's a, the ramp's over there, ramp's over there, like, yeah, yeah, please. Sam, okay, Sam, Sam is coming. One, two. Hey, the, the soundboard can crash and burn without you, it's all right. We'll be good. One, two, three, four, five. Who are we missing? One, two, three, four, five, six. There's one missing, right? Huh? Suki! Hello? Please, please. Don't jump. All right. So these are people that have identified with us uh, formally as as members. Um, I just want to read a passage for us. Like, what is this about? What does this mean? Is this like some kind of like, uh, what? Here we go. Look, it says in Acts 2, verse 41, and those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day 3,000 people were added to them. Added to what? Added to the church. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayers. Then later it says, and all believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God and having faith with the people. That's what this is about. So I've had, a ple- I've had the pleasure to start to get to know Jennifer um, and her, her rich theological her- heritage. Uh, I've gotten to know uh, Suki as the ultimate prayer warrior. If you, look, if you got problems, don't ask me to pray for you. Ask her to pray for you. I'm not even being sarcastic. I've got to know Janet as the ultimate th- sponge who absorbs everything, like, in two seconds. That, that is good. And uh, these are my parents. Got to see them come to faith. And they, they came to faith, and they just became, like, immersed in the church overnight got to know Adrian uh, in a lot of ways, talking theology, but also, like, screaming at basketball games in my house, like, <laughs> mad man when my kids are upstairs asleep. <laughs> got to know Sam and how she is very quiet, but she says profoundly thoughtful things that are helpful. So it's a pleasure to, for them to formally identify with us today. And we're going to take some vows that, you know, are not something other than what we find in Scripture about a Christian. And for those of you who are like, oh, I would would like to consider the the membership conversation, we will do it again early next year and go through another classes, two classes. 
So when I read this, please respond the first two, I do, and the last three, I, I will. So the first is, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise, listen to this very, I love this language, in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit, that you will endeavor to live a life as becomes followers of Christ? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and its work to the best of your ability? This is the one that makes everyone pause for a second, but it's still, it, believe me, it's scriptural, all right? Do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? All right, it's my pleasure to present to you as new members. Uh, make it a point to give them some COVID love. COVID love is, you know, you know. Let me uh, pray. Father, I pray that you would use these spirit and dwelt believers to build up this body, to, to, to grow this body. Um, and as they are a vital part of this, the growth of this body, as they are the ligaments that are being spoken of in Ephesians 4 that need to be properly working in the body, I pray that people in this city would come to know Jesus. We are in the adoption business and in the raising up kids business. So God, would you please leverage them by your grace in this church? Amen. Amen. Y'all can go down. All right. So I want to switch something up today. Instead of me reading uh, a benediction, all of you, can you please open your, can you please open your uh, bulletins to this thing, this page that says Nicene Creed. So we just preached about, celebrated who God is. You know what's cool about this that we talked about today? It's been talked about in the same way we're talking about it for a real long time. So I want us all to say this together. I, I want to, us to confess the beauties of a triune God that we are saved by together. I want to read this together. You ready? Everyone got your, your Nicene Creed paper? One, two, three. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and of earth, of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, be God from all the ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made for us and our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Now remember, Catholic church does not mean Roman Catholic church. It means universal church. You are dismissed in the Lord. Remember what I said about the ladies getting something even if you're not staying, okay? You are dismissed.